And so church, we're asking you tonight to grab your Bibles. We're still going to take a little bit of this time for teaching in our Y series. We're going through the Y series and we are talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. And it is very necessary tonight that we cover the ground that we need to cover this evening because of the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one who at this time is doing a work in your life as a believer and he's going to keep doing that work that he has started. He will not stop no matter what you feel or think. He's not gonna give up on you, he's not gonna quit. And he's gonna finish that work because the Holy Spirit, can I put it to you this way? The Holy Spirit is under contract, as it were, with God the Father and God the Son. So in a sense, allow me to put it this way, it's kind of clumsy, but play along with me. The Father sent the Son to this world to be born and to live and to experience everything you and I experience. In fact, the Bible says Jesus experienced more of the pressures of this life. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ then, having been resurrected from the dead, ascended back to heaven. And the proof positive fact that Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven was the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, at the time of this message, me speaking to you right now, we've recently come out of Resurrection Sunday, Easter, and we're heading toward Pentecost Sunday, May 31st. Why is May 31st this year important in the year 2020? Because it's the Sunday of Pentecost. And what is that? It's the descent of the Holy Spirit giving birth to the church 2,000 years ago. The church was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the, listen, the Father is in heaven. Jesus ascended back to heaven. The Holy Spirit came down and he's been here ever since. Living and breathing and teaching and ministering in the lives of the believers, the things of God. Jesus said, everything that I've taught you and more, he will give you when he comes. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to be working in you and I right now and be preparing us that when the Lord comes, listen, in one of two ways, if you die tonight having accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit ushers you into the presence of heaven and of Jesus at your death. In a sense, his work is done in your life. But if the rapture happens, which I pray happens now, any day now, any moment now, that is when the Lord comes for his church. The Bible makes it very clear. Christ only comes down as far as what is, we would could say, the high atmosphere. We don't exactly know exactly where that is, but it's somewhere above our atmosphere, probably, quite possibly, uh, in the uh, heavens where maybe our atmosphere meets space. What is that? I forget. 126 miles? I don't remember. It's, I'm an old guy. But it's, it's where our atmosphere goes into the space realm, celestial realm. The Bible says Christ will appear. And the scripture says that with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the shout, the dead will rise first and then we who are alive at that moment will be caught up to meet them in the air. And the Bible says we will forever be with the Lord from that moment on. He takes us back to the fulfillment of John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3, where it says there he's been preparing a place for us to dwell. It's called the rapture of the church. At that moment that the rapture takes place, the Holy Spirit's job in your life is done. And his job, listen, is done regarding the church. From that moment on, everyone who comes to Christ after that on earth they are known as tribulation saints. They're not members of the church. It's very powerful that you know that. And so tonight, we're gonna to be talking about the issues that are coming upon us and how the Holy Spirit relates to us. So allow me to be somewhat methodical, if you would, because we're gonna be talking about depression, sadness, sorrow. How do I handle that at this time? Listen, no matter what your belief system is, you've got to agree with me that man possesses a immaterial part. Okay, even atheists believe this. See, what do you mean immaterial part? Well, this is our material part. This. 
is our material part. I have clothes on my material part. I do not have these clothes on my immaterial part. And in fact, the, the body is just a small aspect of our person. I know we focus so much on the body and that's, that's wrong. We, we leave the spirit and the soul and the mind, we neglect it and we just do everything about the body. Uh, but this body is simply low on the totem pole and it's only a vehicle. It's a tool by which we live out our lives. But there's this immaterial part of who we are. The Bible tells us that one of the immaterial parts is man's consciousness, man's self-awareness, that man can think, man can plan, man can author a poem, man can write a song, he can sing it. We are unique then from the angels and from the animal kingdom. And so we should be. The Bible's clear. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible teaches us that then God said, let us make man in our image. That word is moral likeness. According to our own likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over every uh, thing on the earth and every creeping thing that's on the earth. God said, man's to have dominion over that. Genesis 1, 26. But listen, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, The Bible tells us, now may the God of all peace himself, listen, sanctify you completely. Listen up. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, body, soul, spirit. You are what is known as a trichotomy. You have an awareness, a self-consciousness, and God made you that way. Now, granted, you and I live in a fallen world now. This world's messed up. Would you agree? Somebody say amen to that. This world's messed up. This is not what God made. We made this mess. This is what we did by rejecting God. We're living with the consequences right now. God didn't make it this way. We took it this way and crashed it. And now he says to us that it's God's will that you be sanctified, that is set apart for God in your body, in your soul, and in your spirit. Remarkable. Bible says that. So we want to challenge the Bible and ask if that's true. It's a good question. The more we have a chance, by the way, to examine and to analyze what has been going on in our world around us in this recent crisis, we have been Attacked, I'll put it subtly, and yet abruptly. Sudden, but abrupt. Attacked, what do I mean by attack? We've been attacked in our minds. We've been attacked in our souls. We've been attacked in our spirit. And it's now even affecting our bodies in the sense that with all of this pandemic news and all of the crises, there's an element now, gosh, I hate to say this, it's adding in, uh, insult to injury, or, uh, but <laughs> you, you would think we've gone through enough. And the world has gone through enough. I don't know why we're thinking that. With the way things have gone, the real trouble's coming. And and what's gonna drive the trouble is what's starting to surface now. And we need to hear about this tonight. And we need to get the answer from God tonight regarding depression and sadness and sorrow and thoughts out of control and intense anxieties and pressures. We need to hear from God Because listen, when you and I worry about things, we're assuming a responsibility upon ourselves that God never intended us to have. God is the one who says, cast all your care upon me and I'll care for you. The world is anxious tonight. And I said the other day that the next wave of the coronavirus is not gonna be a temperature or vomiting or uh, whatever. It's going to be depression. And we now we hear world experts talking about that very thing. But for the Christian, what do we do when we have such a great God and live in a, such a messed up world? Emotional distress, the fear of the unknown, sadness over the loss of friends. Friendships have been broken. Listen, I'm, I was reading this from uh, a CDC website on how to cope. Listen, people are having a difficult time not being able to Relate to friends, it's desperate. You say, yeah, but the rules are, listen, man makes rules, God gives life. There's an issue here where people are beginning to become suicidal and desperately, desperately sad because they have no 
correlation with other friends, coworkers, the disruption of routine, the loss of income, now that's hitting and it's gonna hit more, family tensions, marital issues. We're seeing that depression and suicide is setting in. And on the national hotline of suicide, it's at an all-time high right now of people calling in. That's why I've chosen tonight to give this message on the Holy Spirit in our lives. I read right now, I quote, depression is a widespread condition affecting millions of people, Christians and non-Christians alike. Those suffering from depression can experience intense feelings of sadness, anger, hopelessness, fatigue, and a variety of other symptoms. They may begin to feel useless and even suicidal, losing interest in things and people that they once enjoyed. Depression is often triggered by life circumstances, such as a loss of job, death of a loved one, divorce, psychological problems such as abuse or an improper awareness of one's self-worth often leads to suicide. So I wanna run through a few things tonight with the short time that we have together and I want you to jot this down if you would. Regarding the Holy Spirit, Pastor Jack, and I'm a Christian and in my life, and yet I'm being tempted to kind of panic and all this kind of stuff. My company's not opening their doors yet. I haven't been able to go to church to get prayed for. I haven't, I've been isolated, and I might even be losing my job. My company's gonna collapse if we don't get back to work soon, and the end will be worse than the beginning. Number one, jot this down, my dear friend, and I'm speaking to the Christian tonight. Write this down. Point number one, me, my mind, and the Holy Spirit is the first consideration. Me, that is you, where you're at. You're the, you're the me, where you're at. I'm the me that's right here. Me, you, our minds, and the Holy Spirit. The news of today, the conversations of today, the social media of today, there are massive origins of stress and misinformation in our lives. Have you noticed that in the last week, when things have been getting better, instantly there's another wave of, a, of attack regarding the narrative. Ladies and gentlemen, church family, wake up. There are people that will not be satisfied with you getting better or the economy opening up or people going back to church and worshiping. They don't want that to happen. And they're angry about it. All over the world, in media and social media and in op-eds and in news reports, bad news, bad news, always constantly bad news. And they're saying things, the narrative is painting a picture. Somebody could have a hiccup and now it's being reported. This could be another uh, indicator of COVID-19, uh, the Ch Chinese Wuhan virus. It could be another indicator. People are out of control. What is driving them? Now, I'm, I'm not excusing all people. I think there are a handful of people that have a sick narrative and they love it. Those are weirdos. That's what I call them. That's the, I was gonna say that's the Hebrew word. I'm joking. Though there, something's wrong with them. They're despisers of what's good. But God, listen, this is not, this doesn't rock the kingdom of heaven, this pandemic. Are you kidding me? This is nothing compared to flus that are out there. I've told you this on Sunday. This is nothing compared to uh, the Hong Kong flu or the, the, a, the uh, avian flu. This is nothing compared to the Spanish flu. But we're all charged up because why? We have been conditioned in our minds to think wrong. So I wanna ask you a, a question, think this. What calm and comfort has come to you from mainstream media? To, you, to your mind. I already hear the answer. Question, have you been blessed and renewed by any one of your smart devices or apps? I don't think so. Have you ever, listen, turned off the TV and said, I feel so much better having watched that program? No. Why? Because right now at this time, a lot of Christians are panicking. Why? Because they watch, watch this, listen. For every hour they watch the news, they probably read the Bible one minute. You had to flip that narrative around in your own life. 
You ought to read the Bible for an hour and then turn on the news to see what the temperature is going to be tomorrow outside. But there's this bombardment upon our minds. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, listen, by the renewing of your mind. This is how you beat this thing. Get into the Bible. I'm, look, I'm human. I get sick of all this stuff. And I'll, I'll get depressed and I'll get down. What do I do? Go to the Bible. I gotta go to the Bible. I read it out loud. I get up in the morning. It's the first place I go. I read it out loud to myself that my mind can hear my voice reading the word of God. Be transformed in the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may be able to prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. So Pastor Jack, how do I fight this? In my mind, how do I fight this onslaught and this coming of depression, sadness, and darkness that's creeping in with the news that's all about me? This is how we're talking about thoughts. The mind is the area of thoughts. Write them down. They could save your life. Are you ready? Here we go. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Get control of your mind. Say to yourself, mind... I'm gonna start taking control because I'm out of control. I am worrying, I am fretting, I'm biting my nails, my stomach's getting sick. I can't even function right. And so I'm gonna gird up the loins of my mind. What does that mean? I'm gonna tie a rope around my thoughts that are flapping out in the wind and leading me to nowhere. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cinch up that cord. I'm gonna bring in these loose thoughts and I'm gonna lasso them and I'm gonna get control, and I'm gonna do it this way. Lord Jesus, give me the power. I know I am praying right now according to your will. Give me your power to wrap these things up and to get control of my mind. I need the power of your Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. See, your emotions and your mind, it's lying to you, isn't it? It's telling you that you're the only one that thinks and feels this way. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's a promise from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 again, verses 3 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, listen, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. How do you do it? By bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We determine now tonight, no matter how depressed we are, listen, no matter how depressed we are, we say right now, Lord, in Jesus' name, you might even want to say it where you're at, Lord, in Jesus' name, I give you my thoughts, I give you my actions of my mind, God. I present them to you, I need your help. I present myself as a living sacrifice to you, God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse five. Hebrews 13, five says, therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That's key. Become a worshiper and watch your mood, your attitude, and the area of your mind begin to change. Become a worshiper, a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Oh, there's nothing to give God thanks for. Stop thinking like that now. Stop thinking like that now. Are you kidding me? If you drop dead today, are you gonna go to heaven, Christian? That's good news. Well, I have a fever, or I'm sick, or I'm broke, or this or that. Listen, that simply means that God is going to take care of you. He's promised you, Christian. Look, if you're not a Christian, you should be freaking out. I get that. But I'm not talking to non-Christians. I'm talking to Christians right now. He has promised to take care of you all the way to heaven. Number two, me, my heart, and the Holy Spirit. My heart. So what do you mean by heart? Well, now I'm back to that immaterial part of man. What do you mean by heart? What do you mean by mind? You mean how smart I am? Nope, not interested in that. It's not what you know, friend, it's who you know. Do you know Jesus? It's not the mind. 
What about the heart? This is another immaterial part of man. I'm not, obviously, I'm not talking about the muscle in your chest. That's just an apparatus to keep everything else going. That is just equipment to cause you to function with your immaterial self, your personality. You don't have a little thing over here. You know, you have got nothing right here by your appendix or your spleen or your liver. There's not a little thing, the little fatty piece of flesh that's your personality. No. Technically, it's not even in the areas of your brain. You have a personality. Listen up, everybody. Jesus Christ died for your sins, not your personality. But you have a heart. When we talk about the heart, we're talking about the deep-seated area of emotion. In fact, the human heart is the most complex component of all the facets of what and who we are. Immaterial in nature, yes, but listen, it's the seat of our intellect, the heart. It's the bulk of who we are. It's the seat of your intellect. It's the seat of emotion. It's the seat of what's called volition, your decision-making process. It's not your brain. That's an apparatus. It comes from the heart. The, Jesus said, as a, as a man's heart is, so the man speaks. And I could add, as a man's heart is, and as he speaks, so he does. All of your actions, all of my actions comes from my heart, our hearts. But listen to this, Psalm 143, verse four. Psalm 143, four. What do I do if I'm depressed and sad? Or I'm getting depressed, I'm getting sad. I'm starting to isolate and close down. Pastor, what do I do? Psalm 143, four. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. A man's laundry in life had been flushed out before the world to read, even to tonight, King David and a few others in the Psalms vented and expressed their heart's dilemma. Why? So you and I could take comfort. This word means that they're being crushed. They don't see any way out. They're about to lose hope. Psalm 139, verse 23. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Can you pray that right now with me? Say it with me if you're depressed and sad. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. God, I'm being reminded right now in this message, I'm not a statistic. I'm a child of the living God. You love me and you've given me life. And Lord, I confess, I have been crippled by fear. I have been crushed by anxieties. I don't have my friends with me, family members isolated. I might lose my job. I've been sequestered. And Lord, I just can't take it anymore. But wait a minute, friend, you're hearing something. And God is saying, I know where you're at. I'm the answer to this crushing. And oh, by the way, on top of it, I'm the one that will deal with your anxieties. And the psalmist makes that announcement, search my heart because I'm laden with anxieties. Acts chapter two, verse 26, a lot of verses, a lot of verses. Acts two, verse 26, therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. That's the answer. The, listen, they went to, they went to, the word of God, and they found hope. Listen, I know it feels like some of you, I'm kicking while you're down, but I'm not. I'm exhorting you. This is exhortation. Stop with the news. Stop with the apps. Stop with the TV. Turn it off. Dive into the Bible. Dive into the word of God. Read the book of Psalms. I'm calling out to the Christian church in America, tonight, now, get back to the Psalms, start reading them, turn off the TV for about, I don't know, 96 hours? Nothing's gonna change, by the way, trust me, I've done it. Turn it off, and when you turn it on, it's gonna be the same bozo arguments. But this will transform your life. Fast, See, so what do you mean fast? Go without food for 24 hours, watch it happens. A calm will come over you as you seek God reading the word and your flesh begins to calm down and God begins to speak to you and your heart begins to be buoyant. 
Psalm 22, verse 14. Psalm 22, 14. I poured out, I, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me was the Psalm of David and it was recited again by Jesus at the cross. Psalm twenty-two, fourteen. 14. My heart was like wax and it melted within me. The, the Hebrew word means my heart was in me and I felt it with the news. I felt it fall inside of me to the bottom of my gut. It means to fall like wax melts and falls. Lamentations chapter two, verse 11. Lamentations two eleven. 11. Listen to this. My eyes fail with tears. My heart is troubled. Ooh, listen, my bile is poured out on the ground. You know, I looked up other versions of this and, the, and in the other versions, it says things really nice and cleaned up. Hey, the old King James and the new King James says it as the word appears. You know what it means? Listen, my eyes fail with tears. It means I've cried so much I don't have any more moisture in my tears. My heart is troubled. We get the thought of earthquake in my heart. Can you imagine earthquake? You say, I don't have to imagine, pastor, I'm going through it. I understand, I do. My bile is poured out on the ground. Do you know what he's talking about? I think you know. My bile, I, I'm so distressed, I vomit from anxiety from fear. My heart is destroyed with all that's going on. It shouldn't be said of the Christian, but if that's you, Christian, get back to the word, get back to him. So listen, how do I fight against my heart, Pastor Jack, and win the raging of my heart? Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. By the way, this is the first verse I memorized as a brand new Christian in 1977. First verse I ever memorized as a Christian. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. Think of the Bible. I found your Bible and I ate it. Your words were found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Why? For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. The word God of hosts means the God of armies. I like that. I found your Bible and I read it like I was eating it. And when I ate it, my heart began to explode with joy because I found out that I'm called by your name. I belong to you, God. Christian, remember, you belong to him because you're the God, the Lord of hosts, the God of armies. You say, how does that correlate? Because you know what? Remember when we were little kids? Um, little guys, I don't know, little kids, boys would do this. I don't know about what little girls would do. But little boys, we'd all say to our friends, um, my dad's taller than your dad. No, he's not. Yeah, he is. Oh, yeah? Well, my dad's richer than your dad. No, he's not. Yes, he is. And then when it really gets nasty, it's this. My dad can beat up your dad. I remember hearing that one time, my dad can beat up your dad. And you know, kids do that. One, one kid said, my dad can beat up your dad. And the, the kid said, that's nothing. My mom can beat up my dad. It was a pretty funny moment. This comparing. Let me tell you, God is your father. He's the Lord of hosts. And there's no weapon formed against you that will prosper. There is no evil that can befall you. Dear Christian, listen up. Nothing can come to you in this life that isn't father filtered. Everything must come through the filter of the father to come to any one of his children. From the flu to joy to war to victory, even loss has got to come through the filter of God for every believer. Take heart in the Lord, my dear friend. Psalm 119 Verse 111 and 112. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my ear to perform your statutes forever to the very end. I'm a Christian and I'm gonna follow God. I'm not giving up.
Number three, me, my soul, and the Holy Spirit. My soul. The word soul, by the way, is uh, in the New Testament, suke. It's where we get the, the foundation. We get the word psychology, sukeology. Uh, the study of the inner person or the mind or the thinking of a person, often referred to as the soul. And uh, we must remember something, by the way, church, that as, uh, it's sadly literally too familiar to us, but to us, uh, we rarely think about it, but this body of ours is the residence of the soul. We always, again, we always think about our body. Listen, there's nothing about your body that's depressed. There's nothing about your body that's sad. I can't do that. This is just a bio machine. It's your soul. The soul makes up much of what you and I are in our existence. The soul. Watchman Nee, Watchman Nee wrote a book called... Um, I forgot the name of the book. The, some, the soul, the, it's, you'll, it's about this thick. I forget. You'll look at it, Watchman Knee and uh, something about the soul, <laughs> I'm sorry. He talked about there regarding the human soul and it's quite fascinating, it's very insightful. But he mentions how the soul is something that goes with the flow. The soul will follow whoever's in charge. If, you, if your flesh is in charge, the soul will allow itself to go down flesh areas. It will think fleshy thoughts. It will do fleshy things. It will, it will approve of whatever the body wants to do. And if, if you are of a spirit led by the spirit of God, your soul will say, let's go worship. Let's read the Bible. The soul will point in any direction that it's being led. That's why he mentions the soul in that book as being a mistress of every man. The soul will do and go with whoever's doing the biggest, the strongest, the loudest flirting. If it's the flesh, then it's going to go. If it's the spirit, then it's going to go. Your soul matters. In Psalm 42, verse 11, Psalm 42, 11, David said, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Why are you so depressed, soul? Imagine David going, why are you so depressed? What's wrong with you? Isn't that amazing? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. You see, you're not a freak for being depressed. You're not a freak for being sad. You're not a freak. You're not some subterranean Christian. You're not some subhuman we're prone to these things. Probably, it's probably safe to say that if anybody was to ever pick to be a Christian or a follower of God in all of history, I would think it would come down to Paul, maybe Peter, I don't know. Noah would be cool. But I think the overriding selection is David. David is like the all about, all around, most representation of the believer's life. And David would often be depressed. Did you know that? Didn't surprise us. He was highly emotional. David was highly creative. He was a worship leader. He was a songwriter. He was an intense warrior. Those kinds of things come with people wired like that. But you don't have to be wired like that to be depressed. But God has an answer for you. Jeremiah 31, 25. Listen, the human soul has emotion, says the Bible. It's not in your body. It's in your soul, your emotions. For I have refreshed the weary soul and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Jeremiah 31, 25. I can tell right now, just in my own heart, that's a verse you're, you're gonna wanna write on your hand or your arm for a while. Jeremiah 31, 25, what a great verse. And then we also know that as Christ followers, that we know that our human soul is often in a battle that rages as a believer, in a war is against the things of this world. That's what many of us are going through right now. Do you understand as a pastor? Look, America has turned so anti-Christ, I should say this, our elected leaders in many of our states have turned anti-Christ. 
They're allowing other things to take place, but not the church. For example, if this, if this facility slapped a Costco sign on it, we could open up tomorrow. But our politics doesn't want us to open because we're a church. You don't think we're fighting up against spiritual powers? It's not the men and women in the flesh. It's the demonic powers that are puppeting them to go against the church. I tell you what, I would never be a governor but, or a president, but if I was a governor or a president, I know a little bit about American history and I know a lot about Bible history. And the first thing I would have done is I would have called prayer meetings once a week and all the churches in America to get safe but go to the prayer meetings and intercede for America. You don't think God would have answered? We'd have been out of this mess by now. He cares, but we're not crying out to him. And our leaders are trying to keep us from crying out to him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. That was my political statement for tonight. 1 Peter 2, 11. Dearly beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. You know what's sad? Listen up, everybody. When this thing hit, did you know people began downloading Bible material, sermons and all this stuff, and nobody was downloading porn. The porn industry online almost died. Isn't that awesome? Now, eight weeks into it, people are starting to go back. They're starting to feel comfortable where they're at to the point where the enemy now comes in and tempts them and people are starting to log on and people are starting to really show the colors. It's sad. But we cannot separate our thoughts from the soul life. All these things are dovetail and mingled together. Third John chapter two. Third, third John chapter two says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God wants your soul to prosper. Hebrews four verse 12 tells us that the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and it can cause the division, and it does that very thing, and the piercing, even between the division of the soul and the spirit. The word of God's the answer. And the Bible goes on in that verse to say that God's word even discerns among the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's an awesome verse for all of the above that we've been talking about is Hebrews 4.12. Number four, me, my spirit, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you and I have a spirit. We read that in our opening, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. God placed a spirit in you. You have a spirit. And by the way, the Bible says that when you and I are born as babies into this world, the Bible says we are spiritually dead. That baby's brand new in this world, nine months old since conception, but new in this world, but spiritually dead. And all that child's life growing up until they're born again, they're spiritually dead. Did you know that? That's what the Bible teaches. She never heard that before. No, you should read your Bible. We're born spiritually dead. That's why the Holy Spirit tries to get us to live again. But in times like this of being where we're at, we need to get alone with God and we need to get nurturing in our spirit from him. The Bible wants to wake us up. Ephesians chapter two, verse one says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Isn't that amazing? Colossians 2, 13 says, and you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, Christ, having forgiven you of all your trespasses, Christian. Remember that you've been forgiven of your sins. You're made anew, you're made alive. It's the spirit man that is new, the born again you that you want to feed and strengthen. Here we go, we're almost done. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Friends, it's still in the Bible. It's still there. Four things I want you to think of. What is the most prevailing thought subject in your life? What's your most prevailing thought? Most constant prevailing thought in your life? Just answer that in your head. Is it God or something else? Number two, 
What do you want more than anything else in this world? If you could have anything in this world right now, what, what would that be? Number three, if you could wish for anything, what would you wish for? Somebody handed you three wishes. What would you wish for? Number one. How about if somebody handed you one wish? What would you wish for? Number four, if you had one chance to make a decision, what decision would you make? I asked you those questions because for the non-believer, the person who is not born again, does not have a, a living spirit, they thought things like win the lottery, uh, go to the beach, uh, become the richest man in the world, uh, see, uh, travel the world. The Christian answered something like this. What's the most prevailing thought in your mind? Jesus, heaven, God, my walk with God. What would you want if you could have anything in this world? To get out of this world. <laughs> but if I have to stay in this world to be drawn closer to Jesus, if you could wish for anything, what would that be? A life that mattered for God, that my life might give glory to him. These are automatic, global, instantaneous, eternal responses from the believer. If you had a chance to make a decision, what would it be? To be with Jesus, something of that nature. Number five, we end here. Me, my body, and the Holy Spirit. My body and the Holy Spirit. The God of the Bible is a redemptive God. He redeems. He must, listen to this, he must, based on his own revelation of his word, he must redeem all things to himself. You say, what do you mean by that? He must. Let me put it to you this way. It's a burden on God's heart that no one perish, but that all come to eternal life. Now, will all be saved? No, he didn't make robots. Some people will reject him even unto death but he's a redemptive God. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you? The Holy Spirit dwells in you, the believer. Can I put it to you bluntly? You don't have the authority and you don't have the right or the license or the freedom to take your own life because you don't own your life. Christian, you can't do it because you belong to him. The Holy Spirit lives in you. He's inside of you. You have no authority to remain depressed when God gives you so many promises. Awake from the dead, arise, you who dwell in the dust. Get up, for the day has dawned and the light has come upon you. Stand. And you need to stand up, at, start getting a shower in the morning, get out of bed, walk, go do something until you're able to go back to work. You must present your body to almighty God who owns you, who bought you at a great price. And we end right here, last verse. Romans chapter 12, verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Isn't that awesome? The God of the Bible doesn't want a dead sacrifice. He wants a living sacrifice. He wants you to not die. He wants you to live. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Think about the narrative of this world and the direction of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It is God's will, as I pray right now, and we end in a song of worship, I'm gonna ask you to stand. It is the will of God that you be, listen, there's no doubt, 100% is the will of God that you be healed of your depression, sadness, of your melancholy because of all of this pressure on you, it is the will of God that you not be depressed any longer. God wants to heal you of this world and narrative. He has given you his word and though they slay me, yet shall I trust in him. If the heavens and the earth are 
removed and the mountains are cast into the sea, yet my soul shall take its delight in the Lord. What shall man do unto me? To live as Christ and to die as gain. Nothing shall separate me from the love of God. You preach to yourself these truths. And Christian, I say by the power of the Holy Spirit, arise. Go to your God. He waits for you. Thanks for watching the Real Life YouTube channel. We love bringing you content that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss one single video or live stream and you can share it with friends and family. If you'd like to support this ministry by helping us reach others, by taking the gospel and the teaching around the world, you can do so by clicking the Give Now button. So thanks again for watching and God bless.